I want to start by taking a moment to just appreciate the beauty on the walls around us and the amazing work that Barb does and this latest show. Barb, when I look around and I, I see these beautiful pictures, um, it's so compelling and I see beauty and I see something otherworldly and magical and I see a little bit of danger and I'm wondering what you see. Well, um, when, I, when I start the series, I actually never really know what I'm doing. I feel it's an instinct. I know what, I'm, what elements I'm putting together, but I don't go, um, you know, I didn't consciously say, this is the journey of my own mental health. Uh, but when I, when I was working on it, I started to understand and recognize what I was shooting. And when it was finished and I was, trying to explain what it's all about, which is always the tricky part for an artist because we're visual. We don't actually, you know, use words. We use pictures. I realized that this work mirrors my own journey, which, you know, is funny because mental health, you'd expect to see women flailing around in the pool or having difficulty or lying on the bottom, more like drowning. But um, for me, th my personal struggle has always been one of survival against all odds, you know. I, I guess we should get it out there right away, because um, I'm sure you're all dying to know. <laughs> <laughs> I have had bipolar since I was born, I think. I've, I honestly felt like I didn't know what it was called, um, but I had um, a terrible struggle when I was under 10. When I was 12, I was barely managing it. And when I was 16, I tried to kill myself. And then um, I think after that, everything was about struggling to get back up. Because I, I left school, I, um, I couldn't, you know, all the signs, the warning signs are, you can't concentrate, you can't eat, you can't sleep. And then I was, uh, you know, 16 years old, 17 years old, and I was um, left behind. My friends all went back to school and went on to university, and I started working at uh, a real estate firm for the controller. And part of my problem is dyslexia. <laughs> so I was typing numbers all day, <laughs> which was pretty bad. Um, and then uh, also modeling a bit because uh, I could earn some money and it was fun and I, it lifted my spirits. And from then on, um, I was hospitalized for depression and then I got back into the working world and I had to recreate myself because, um, you know, here I was alone. None of my friends from school, very few of them, um, supported me or even stayed in touch with me. I, I think there were two girls that did after that, and everybody else was like hundreds of years older than me. I think there were like 20. <laughs> you know? But I was a kid, and uh, I, was, I was making it up as I went along. So I, I you know, got out of the hospital, and I, I did some modeling. And what happened is, because of what happened to me, I can do this today. And it's, aside from the fact that, you know, that physically I can do it, had the opportunity because I, I had modeled for what was a fledgling newspaper. It was, I think, one month old, the Toronto Sun. And <laughs> they honestly offered me a job to be their fashion editor six months later. And I was 17. I think I'd been on an airplane once. <laughs> and they were sending me to cover the collections. And there's, there's somebody here I haven't seen in a hundred years from the sun, Hugh Wesley, who actually got me started in photography. Uh, I was planning the fashion shoots at the sun. <laughs> and the news photographers um, couldn't win any awards. Seriously, um, there were no awards for fashion photography back then, and they wanted the firefighters award and all those big things. <laughs> so he said, hey, let's just get you some cameras and, you know, we'll teach you. And that's kind of how it began. But it happened because I was kind of, um, you know, thrust into a different world. Otherwise, I would have been a librarian. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so I want to hear a little bit about how your creativity has merged with helping you through your own 
lifetime search for mental health then. How did going into the world of photography and, and really finding your place as an artist, how does that inform how you've dealt with depression and, and how you've managed to move forward? Well, that's a great question because, again, it's very instinctive, but I, I was always an artist, but I didn't think you could be one if you couldn't draw. And I would spend an entire weekend making a birthday card. But that wasn't being an artist, right? I'm not really an artist. But I found with photography, I literally lost myself. I, I would get into a world, and as long as I was making work and creating art, I was fine. And it was something I was good at too, which is something that, you know, you have to find what you're good at, whether it's, you know, jumping a vault or, you know, fixing cars or whatever. This was something I knew I could do, and I knew I'd be good at it, and I also, I fell into a pattern. I trusted myself, and I got myself busy doing that because that's how I knew to keep my mind away from depression, which is it's something I've, I've had forever. It comes and goes in intensity, but uh, I know it's always going to come back. And you know, the people who are here today, a lot of them know me, and they're so important to me. They support me. They've seen me when I, I actually didn't know I was in trouble because that's the insidious thing about this disease. You think you're having a hard time, but it's nothing. Um, and you know, your friend hears you, and, and they go, you know, many times they've said, call your doctor, get off the phone with me, call your doctor, and call me right back. Or I've seen my doctors, uh, one of them I saw for many, many years, and he's passed away in another one, and both have said on occasion, um, like, I really didn't know it was that bad, why didn't you tell me? And I thought, well, I have, you know, but you don't say it. You know, that's the thing with this disease, is sometimes you're so inside of it that you don't say, you don't see the warning signs yourself. And we're all very self-reliant. You know, we all think we can cope, and, but we can't. And I have been saved many, many times, you know, sometimes by friends, sometimes by doctors, many, many times by my husband. Uh, I didn't think he signed on for that, but <laughs> 40 years later, we're good, so. <laughs> But, you know, it's the idea, too, that here you are, this very successful artist, pass you on the street. We don't know your backstory. And, I mean, you've said to me, you really would like to get to the place where we could talk about this the way we talk about a broken leg or a sprained ankle, that the stigma of this. And if we all knew who we were passing on the street and they knew what we were thinking, we might be able to have more of a dialogue and, and understand that that's one layer of who you are, but there are many layers of who you are and many layers of abilities and accomplishments. That well, I know that we all have some level of mental illness. I mean, it's just the society that we live in. And what does it look like is something that, you know, I often ask myself and I think, um, I think it's, this last few years has been a really tough go for me. And um, I felt that I couldn't pretend anymore. I was very good at pretending. I felt I couldn't pretend anymore, that everything was fine. And I also thought I didn't want to. Like, why should we, right? This is what a person who struggles with mental health looks like. One in five Canadians suffer from mental health. 4,000 people die a year from suicide, and 1,000 of those people are children because they don't even know they're having trouble. And if you think about those numbers, and then think about all the people who don't admit that they're depressed or having trouble, I would say the number is closer to one in three, quite frankly. And the federal government, the provincial government, do not provide services. In the developed world, we rank very low. We, we have, of the health budget that we get, only 7% is given to mental health. 
uh, wait times for help is agonizingly long, especially if you have someone that you're trying to help or you need help. You can't wait. It's, it's just that clear. You cannot wait or you will die. Which is crazy because health dollars come from us. So we have to stand up, we have to say something, because the, the weight is unacceptable. Do you know that I have found doctors for people, strangers and, and friends of friends, and, and it's been so incredibly difficult, because psychiatrists um, are few and far between. And I'll tell you something, what's going through the, t uh, the tubes now for mental health is that you get X number of visits, let's say a certain number of dollars, or a certain number of visits for mental health, and it's inadequate. I know from my own experience, I've been seeing a doctor for 50 years, okay? Not 10 visits, and you need, you need that much time because they save your life. This is not a disease that can be cured. It is a disease that gets managed. Where can people go? Bell Let's Talk has a great website. Um, Change Direction, an organization that I'm working with in the States, um, Given Hour, has a great website. I have on my website, under mental health, if you go to barbaracole.com forward slash resources, or it's written around this button, which I hope you'll take and wear and take a second one and give to somebody, um, it will give you about seven or eight fantastic places. There's a place called Mind Beacon that um, I've been told about, and they are online, so you get 10 visits online with a therapist, and then you get some cognitive behavioral therapy at your own time, at your own discretion, after work, at lunch hour, you know, it's all good. Uh, there's um, some other numbers that are answered, not by a volunteer, but by a nurse. And then that nurse will give you immediately a, a person to talk to. And that's critical because you can't be, when you're, when you're depressed, you can't find this help. So there's seven or eight really, really strong places on that site. And if you go on that site, then you'll find each of those people that I've recommended have their own list of fantastic things. One thing that I saw on CAMH was um, that you put together, you, you have to have a trusted friend that you talk to, um, and they have to know you well enough that this is a serious problem. And, you know, we all fake it really, really well. And you can't fake it with this person. And you have a, a strategy. You have a phone number, uh, a doctor, what you want to do, if you're in trouble, what you agreed to do, who you agreed to contact. And that's going to ha you have to do that. Because, you know, it isn't like a broken leg in that people give you so much more sympathy when you break your leg. When, you're, when you have a mental health problem, people roll their eyes. There is a huge stigma. Now, fortunately, I can talk about this because I'm an artist and we're all supposed to be crazy. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is how I come into the picture. <laughs> hey, well, and you're a survivor. What does the work that you do, what does it give you? What does it give you in terms of how you survive? Well, I shoot for serenity. I make beautiful pictures that have depth, but I need that beauty because what is going on in my mind all the time is not beautiful. And when I get especially underwater, and anyone who does underwater photography in this room will understand, you're in a, on a different planet. It's quiet. It's protected. You feel uh, relaxed. I mean, I will often just lie on the floor of the pool and stare up at the trees above the pool. And it's like the best thing to do. Um, but try it. <laughs> uh, it's really good. Um, but I need to shoot pictures that have a degree of calmness, you know. And I bet people who, who do crazy pictures are extremely calm inside, you know, but as an artist, you do the opposite. And doing this work makes me feel relaxed, and I work like a crazy person because that's my love. It's my safe place. And I also wanted to thank you all so much for coming and supporting this because it means so much to me. 
and I think that it's so important that we get the word out and we are allowed to talk about mental illness, that we can say the word and then say, how are you? You know, like, how's it going? I hear you were, had a rough time last week. Are you feeling better now? And you're allowed to say, not great, you know, well, I'm doing it, I'm, I'm managing, but you know, it's a struggle. Because all of us say we're fine. You look at Instagram, for heaven's sake. <laughs> we're not fine. Nobody's that fine. <laughs> So let's wear a button and take one and promise me that you'll give it to somebody and tell them that there are resources around the outside of the button that will help because that's, that's it's so important, you know. People die in a second and then th the world goes on the next day, but they couldn't wait. They couldn't wait one more evening and, you know, it's just, it's just the way it goes. There's been you know, a couple of amazing photographers lately who are no longer with us uh, because of this problem and, and many, many more people. And I want to thank Anna Maria Tremonti as well because she's a dear friend and she could have said no. <laughs> I owe her for the rest of my life now. <laughs> but um, I was afraid to talk to you on my own. You know, I wanted to say what was going on in a meaningful way, and she is here to make sure I don't go on a U-turn. You know, it's, it's a very emotional and it's a very personal um, story that I don't share easily. But like I said, I got tired, I got sick and tired of feeling like I had to hide it. And, and I don't think we need to. You know, I think when we look at your work, um, there's just, there's so much beauty in it, and but there's so many layers, and we don't always know, you know, I'm not an expert on art, and but I've always been drawn to your work, and I've, I've understood there's more there, and then when you tell me your story, I understand that I'm seeing all of those things in your work, that you've put all of that in. And it's, again, really interesting to me that a couple of years ago you did Falling Through Time and all the women were falling and today all the women are rising and like there's, there's, there's so much meaning in your work to help us understand your own journey and, and how maybe we should not be afraid of the journeys of our, our own journeys or those of those around us, you know, because uh, mental illness touches every single one of us and um, it's just such a hard thing to talk about. Yeah, I know, it really is. What do you want us to think about when we look at your pictures? I want you to feel like these women are strong and they're survivors, like a lot of us are, you know, it's, it's you can be, beautiful and feminine it can be a soft cell you know and if you keep on going it's not over you know that's the main thing is you just have to you know take it a minute at a time or an hour at a time or a day at a time and and realize your you know there are people around you very important talk to people Include them in your life because we just isolate. When I'm not feeling well, uh, well, you know, I used to drink. <laughs> um, uh, that didn't help. Now uh, I'll, I'll sleep or I'll, I'll read. I do a lot of reading. But I don't do a lot of talking to people. And I have to force myself. It's very, very difficult to say I'm in trouble. But it's that one person who tells you they love you or that you count, that it's just crazy, it just means so much. Uh, and it, it, it's all you need to get going and keep on moving. And then we're okay. You know, people who commit suicide just didn't have the luck of having a person there at the right time. That's all it is, you know? And uh, so, I mean, I've been blessed. 
I have a great support network. Um, my husband's been amazing, and my daughters understand completely. And in fact, I should say, mental illness, it's hard for you going through it, but it's so hard for the people around you. It affects everybody in so many ways because your kids are having, you know, your kids are having trouble because you're not present. You know, you're, you're hiding. You're not able to tell them. You don't want to burden anybody, but you don't want to talk about it with them because it's not their job to take care of you. Um, and um, actually coming back to my art, I would say I've been blessed to have the same assistant for 20 years. Mark, put your hand up. <laughs> he speaks Barb, <laughs> and I have thrown entire shows in the garbage, and he's taken them out of the garbage <laughs> and said, let's just break it down. <laughs> you know, uh, and that's, that's, you know, I'm, I'm lucky, right? There are so many people who can't reach out. They're just not able to. And if you see someone who's not doing well, ask them if they're OK. That's fine. That's all they need. I once had to get my windshield wiper replaced. And I was so, I was suicidally depressed. And I went into this garage. And this guy not only sold me the windshield wiper, but he said he put it on if I wanted to wait inside his little hot room. I went like, wow, that's so nice, you know? And that's all it took, seriously. Well, I, I just, um, I want to thank you for your courage in talking to us about all of this. And um, I'm going to predict that, that there are people you may not even know about who you're going to inspire just by being public. And thank you. Thank you for being so honest with all of us and for urging us to think about all of this in a different way. Barbara Cole.